is a new time stretch slash pitch shift algorithm available in Reaper as of version 657, allowing for extreme time stretching of audio. This algorithm is not a wholly new invention. It is quite similar, though not identical to standalone software like Paul Stretch or Hourglass by Zanakius, an awesome program I've covered in an old tutorial, the link to which you can find below. You'll have undoubtedly heard these programs in action. If you've ever gone on YouTube and listened to a song like uh, Metallica's Nothing Else Matters, slow down 20 times. Which turns these rock songs into wild ambient soundscapes. All that said, however, having this algorithm implemented into the DAW instead of having to contend with using external editors makes it a very welcome addition to Reaper's ever-growing set of unique features. Not to mention that both Paul Stritch and Hourglass are open source software that are not particularly well maintained across all operating systems. <coughs> Mac. <coughs> While on its face, it may look like a fun, but ultimately niche sound design tool, there are many awesome use cases for this algorithm. I've been playing around with it a bit myself, and today I'm gonna show you some of the cool stuff you can do with it, starting from the basics and moving up to the more fun stuff. So let's get to it. So I have a project in front of me here, and as you can see, we've got six guitar tracks all coming out of the guitar bus track. Let's have a quick listen. So just playing chords, nothing too special here, but they do make for great starting material for creating a unique pad-like sound to underline the chord changes. To do this, I'm gonna right click on the record arm button of the bus track, and I'm gonna select record output, stereo. This will allow Reaper to record the sum of all these six tracks in real time. So with the track armed, let's record a few measures. That'll probably do it. I'm gonna grab this item and move it a bit further down the project and I'll hover the mouse to the right edge of the item, hold option, and I'm gonna start stretching this item way out. This will make the item play much slower, a 10th of its original recorded speed to be exact. With the item selected, I'll hit F2 to open the media item properties, and let's make sure this box to preserve the original pitch is ticked. And let's first select an existing algorithm, like the Elastique 3.3.3 Pro. Hit apply, and now if we play the sound, we get this. So it's, uh, it's definitely a sound, and it's not necessarily a bad sound, but these algorithms aren't exactly designed for extreme stretching of audio. Their purpose is to allow for time and pitch correction of near perfect recordings. Stretching the file too far may result in an overly glitchy sound, which if that's what you're into, works for sure. But let's hit F2 again, and this time select the new RIA algorithm. I'll leave the rest of the settings as is for now. We'll come back to them later, and let's hear it. So this time we can definitely hear less glitching and instead hear a much more uh, shimmery, fluttery, buttery sound. When we play parts closer to the onset of these chords, we get an effect almost as if they are being picked really fast. And closer to the tail, we simply get a smooth pad-like sound of the chord. What Rhea is doing, if I understand it right, is splitting audio into tiny little chunks, also known as windowing. And then based on how much the item is stretched, looping these tiny segments with crossfades to create a smoother stretched sound that works just as well with polyphonic material as well. From here, you have some control over the size of the chunks or windows and some other parameters, which we'll get to shortly, to alter the resulting sound. For now, let's stick to the default settings and I'm gonna chop up the resulting audio and lay them on this new track to add a pad-like sound to the composition. So let's hear it with and without.
So tons of fun. You can do this with almost any base material and the result will be unique textural pads that would take ages to synthesize using other methods like wavetable synthesis. Awesome. So another fun thing to do with Rhea is using it on more percussive material, which results in a reverb-like effect, smudging the transients and lengthening the tails. I'll demonstrate this using a snare recording from this project. I recorded the snare bottom for the drums using two SM57 mics to get a wide stereo sound for my snare bottom while keeping the snare top center focused and mono. And I personally love the results and highly recommend it, but not to stray too far from the topic at hand, Let's put some Rhea magic on this. I'll first start by duplicating my snare bottom track. You can do this by right clicking the track and choosing duplicate tracks. Or as I have done, you can bind it to a hotkey. Next, I'll set my grid size to a half note and I'll split the item at grid lines using the action split items at timeline grid. Since the snare hits on this track mostly happen on the two and four, doing this will give us each individual snare sound as its own item. So with all of them selected, I'm gonna trim them a bit, making sure to line up the beginning as close as I can to the transient of the item. Also grab the other end and trim it back a bit to get rid of the tail end and the bleed. And now I can hold option and grab the right edge of the files and stretch them out as far as they go. Stretch the beginning to line them up with transients. And once again, let's hit F2 and select the RIA algorithm. So let's hear the results. So as you can hear, it's a very similar sound to a reverb, which is great because as much as I love Reaper, I've never been particularly impressed with the stock reverb offerings. So this is pretty awesome to have at your fingertips. From here, playing with the additional settings can get you all kinds of cool reverb flavors. The FFT options up top deal with the window size we mentioned earlier, dictating the size of each chunk of audio that the algorithm graphs to synthesize. So let's hear them. The different types of analysis and synthesis options available deal with how the fast Fourier transform is performed. The exact maths to this are very complicated and not really within the scope of this tutorial, but perhaps one day with the help of my buddy Leandro Facchinetti, we can really geek out on it. I'll also link to a short 15 page paper I found on the topic, which is great for getting a brief overview without losing too many brain cells in the process. Let's set the window size back to the default and hear each different type. So just from hearing them, I find the rectangular style to be the most vastly different, as it seems to have the shortest, most subtle crossfade between the chunks, resulting in a more sustained sound with less decay. While the other three, at least in this context, seem to have noticeable, but kind of hard to pinpoint differences. Some seem to work better on the low end, some work better than others if the source material is noisy, and so on. The paper I mentioned earlier provides us with some guidelines to select the appropriate type based on source material and desired effect. But again, this is best left to you as you experiment with your own sounds. Finally, the synthesis amount plays a huge role in the resulting sound. The default is 4x, but bringing this down to 3x results in this. As the title suggests, a much more pulsing sound, perhaps more akin to a delay versus a reverb. And from here, adjusting the FFT size achieves an effect similar to adjusting the rate of a delay with a moderate to high feedback. Increasing the synthesis amount results in a smoother, more smudged sound.
And again, with shorter window sizes, So I'll let you experiment with your own sounds and find the appropriate one, but hopefully it's clear to you that you have a nearly endless array of different reverb and delay-like effects you can use to season your productions with. In fact, instead of just sticking to one of these, I'm going to vary the algorithm settings to add some extra interest here. I'll use the script SPK77, select every nth item for this. So run it and you'll see this window. And to select, say, every fifth item, I'll hover my mouse over here and move the mouse wheel. Let's also give them a new color, and let's choose a shorter window size and a bigger synthesis value. Hit apply. It helps to dock your media item properties window so you don't have to keep opening and closing it. But yeah, I'll run the script again, set an offset here, again, moving my mouse wheel. So the next every fifth item is selected. And let's again give this a new color and choose a different type. And I'll rinse and repeat for the remaining chunks. So each fifth hit is now synthesized using different algorithm settings. Let's hear the whole thing in context. Fun, fun, fun. One complaint I would have is that given all these options, using the media item properties window is a bit of a hassle. Perhaps an auto apply option in the preferences could be nice, so you don't have to constantly select the settings and hit apply to hear the results. To that end, wouldn't it be great if we could use RIA as a plugin? Well, maybe we can, but you'll have to stay tuned right after these messages. So to bring this already long video to an end, I wanted to show you something you may not have known about, and that is that you can use Rhea as a real-time-ish effect. To do this, let's look at this bell sound that I have on this project. So again, pretty straightforward. Let's once again duplicate this track, and on the duplicate, I'm gonna put an instance of Rhea Pitch, Reaper Stock Pitch Shifter. If you look at the bottom, you can see that Rhea Pitch gives us a choice in the type of algorithm we use for pitch shifting. And of course, you can also now use Rhea for this. The cool thing with Rhea is that it makes an effect even when no pitch shifting is occurring otherwise. So simply by loading up Rhea Pitch on this track and selecting Rhea, we get an effect like this. Again, kind of a nice shimmery reverb type of sound, which I find really pleasant and absolutely no stretching or pitch shifting required. And of course, you can also just do this on the original track, adjusting this dry wet knob up here to get your desired effect amount. But by duplicating the track, I just get more control. I can EQ and pan it separately and so on. So you do you, but I think this sound is different enough that I would want it on a new track. Once again, playing with all the settings causes the resulting effect to change in real time, which is awesome. And for this type of more melodic material, I find the smallest window size to give us the best result. Or at least one that introduces the least amount of pre-ringing and more definition on the resulting shimmers. With the largest window size, the sound of the pre-ringing precedes the beginning of the passage. but with shorter window sizes, this doesn't happen. Finally, I can grab this slider and shift this thing up an octave and we get this effect. Super awesome if you ask me. And as a bonus, we can add a bit of vibrato effect to the sound for extra width and interest. For this, I'll duplicate the Rhea Pitch instance, select a different algorithm down here, and I'm gonna give this slider to shift the sound in sense a little wiggle, then click on the param box up here and choose parameter modulation slash link. Let's use the sine LFO for this. I'll make sure it's centered, bring the strength down and set the baseline to the middle. I'd want the vibrato to be quite mild, 
perhaps between 25 and minus 25 cents or thereabouts. Tick this box to sync the tempo and let's set it to one quarter note. Now we get a bit of a vibrato on the shimmers as well, which sounds pretty cool to me. I've also used a similar setup on duplicates of these guitar tracks, setting the pitch shift amount to minus one octave instead to get these growly low end pads on the beginning of my track, which helps fill the low end a bit before the bass kicks in. So the pre-ringing I keep mentioning is probably easiest to hear in this scenario. And if I put the plugin on the item and glue it, we can even see it. But again, that could be something that you want. It's kind of a fun sound that preempts the onset of each chord, so I like it. All of this may beg the question, can we also use Rhea as a live effects? And the answer is kinda no. The one issue you would run into if you use Rhea in a live situation is that doing so will introduce a significant amount of latency for the algorithm to do all the required math. Even in the smallest window size, we can see that Rhea pitch is reporting about 4,000 samples of latency, which is definitely enough to throw off a live player. And at the larger window sizes, you may get over one second of latency. You would also probably have to increase your buffer size to give Reaper time to calculate everything, so long story short, it's not very practical to use Rhea as a real-time effect, but once you record some stuff, you can go nuts and create all sorts of interesting sounds. I will say though that I had a lot of fun with this regardless, setting the wet amount of the effect to 100% and playing in real time, which results in this kind of reverse reverb sound that's quite enjoyable to play around with. Here I've chosen the largest window size, the largest synthesis value, and the rectangular analysis window, The latency issue definitely makes it quite tricky to play this to say a click, but by all means slap it on, record some sounds, and then you can later chop those up and place them into your project as fun little kind of sonic decoration. So there you have it, that's gonna be it for today. Leave your questions in the comments, and if you like the work I do, you can support the channel with one-time donations through buymeacoffee.com, or you can become a member of the channel here on YouTube and get access to some exclusive content. It's great to be back making more videos, albeit at diminished capacity for a while, but I hope you learned something and hope to see you soon. Bye.